part of a larger project um, aimed at explicating an empiricist philosophy of science. So there seems to be a sense in which epistemic progress has been made over the history of inquisitor-human interaction with nature, and yet it's difficult to pinpoint exactly in what such progress consists. The ontologies and mathematical structures of scientific theories have changed over the course of history, and so have the methods of inquiry. But what, if anything, has accumulated through such change? And does that accumulation amount to epistemic progress, to learning more and more about what the world is like? I'm approaching these questions um, with the idea that empirical evidence is what accumulates and that therefore is what is at the heart of the notion of epistemic progress, insofar as there is such a notion of that. Well, I can't defend the whole picture today, I want to argue for how I think we should conceive of empirical evidence in the first place. And in particular, I want to emphasize that our conception of evidence must, be, must um, sufficiently reflect the sense in which data and the empirical results derived from data is data skillfully wrought by a, the incorporation of presuppositions that condition the form and content of empirical constraints on theory. Amazing. <laughs> Great metaphor. <laughs> um, so this talk has three main components. The, uh, the purpose of the first is to criticize a problematic but I think ubiquitous family of views of, um, of evidence. Then I'll present an alternative view illustrated with a case study. And in the third part of the talk, I'll present a characterization of empirical adequacy that's appropriate to the, um, to the view of evidence that I've presented. Um, and I'll discuss uh, the conditions under which empirical adequacy in this sense can be adjudicated. So um, let me start with something that I hope we all agree about. Um, good theories, whatever else they are, are empirically adequate. They're consistent with all of the available evidence. Um, I want to flag, of course, right away a couple caveats. Um, so for present purposes, I mean something very broad by theories here, um, encompassing formal entities like sets of axioms and the models that satisfy them, but also sets of hypotheses expressed as propositions, and even in precise mixtures of um, mathematics and narrative components. Um, okay, and furthermore, um, that good theory is understood in this very broad sense need to be consistent with the available evidence doesn't mean that um, whenever a theory encounters anomalous evidence, um, it should be abandoned without further regard. Um, but it does mean that when theories are inconsistent with um, some relevant evidence, something's got to give. And here, of course, I'm only talking about scientific theories that are supposed to be theories of our actual world. That is, I'm setting aside for um, for instance, theories that scientists might uh, investigate for their intrinsic value or um, uh, their intrinsic interest, as well as theories of primarily instrumental value, such as might arise in, instrument, uh, in engineering, medicine, <coughs> other applied and synthetic sciences. So in such cases, what makes a theory good need not necessarily improve, uh, need not necessarily involve empirical adequacy, um, but in contrast, being subject to the onus of empirical adequacy is a constituent of what we mean by empirically viable theorizing. So, um, this, I take it, is the minimal commitment of empiricism. To have any hope of learning from experience at all, the world has to be able to push back on our understanding of it, and the pushing happens through the mechanism of maintaining empirical adequacy. But of course, it's a law in philosophy that as soon as someone says, I hope we all agree about X, someone has to say that X is entirely unreasonable and just wrong. <laughs> so here are Bhaktivat uh, Salam and Cartwright playing that role in a very recent paper, maybe you've seen from the European Journal for Philosophy of Science, titled, What's So Special About Empirical Adequacy? <laughs> um, so they write, to mandate empirical adequacy as a minimum criterion for scientific theory is entirely unreasonable and just wrong. <laughs> So, happily, I think, um, in this case, I don't, I don't think we actually disagree, um, since in their paper, um, Dr. Baslam and, and Kurt Wright are arguing that scientists um, want theories for lots of reasons, besides faithfully representing the actual world, and in particular, um, in cases where scientists are primarily interested in, in managing the world, in their words, criteria besides empirical adequacy can take priority in the distance of theory choice. And this is just what I've already said, that um, the minimal commitment of empiricism does not hold straightforwardly in applied and synthetic sciences, where researchers uh, can reasonably prioritize practical successes over learning. Okay. 
I'm happy to talk more about this paper too, since it's so recent and I think it is relevant to the subject. Um, okay. There are, nevertheless, I think, um, parameter problems for the minimal commitment of empiricism. So consider the history of measurements for the Hubble parameter today. That is the current rate of expansion of the universe. So this plot um, depicts measurements from 1970 to 2009. Um, and you'll notice that some of these data points, ostensibly measuring the value of the very same parameter, disagree outside of each other's error bars. Okay? Um, and in fact, if we tried to plot Hubble's original value, it would be way up off the chart. Um, <coughs> And here are um, actually a couple of recent values as measured using the Planck and WMAT cosmic microwave background satellites and some other methods. Um, and so now the value of the plot is uh, value of the parameters on the horizontal axis, and these are just kind of like spaced by source of data. Um, but you'll notice that um, you know the the cosmic microwave background uh, values, uh, even if taking into account their error bars, fall outside the um, the Cepheid value, which is the method that Hubble used. Okay. So, um, so even as we speak in 2017, there are measurements of Hubble parameter that disagree. <clears throat> and this is not how we'd hope that um, the history of measuring a value of some parameter would go. Right? We'd hope it looked something like this. Um, so here's uh, an example from particle physics. This is the mass, measured mass of the W boson. And you know the error bars start out big in the 1980s, and they get progressively small over time, and the measurements nest within one another, honing in on a precise value ca already captured by the original big error bars, right? Um, so this is what we'd like to see, but not all, <laughs> not all history is like this, and not even in particle physics. So here's another one. This is the mass of the eta. Um, and this plot is disturbing in the same way that the Hubble um, parameter plot was disturbing. These um, values jump outside of each other. <coughs> So I said these sorts of cases present a prima facie problem for the minimal commitment of empiricism. How so? Um, well, the minimal commitment specifies that good theories are supposed to be consistent with all of the evidence, all of the available evidence. Um, but if we think of the corpus of evidence as made up of empirical results, then the corpus of empirical evidence appears to be discontinuous and contradictory. The body of evidence made up of empirical results is internally inconsistent. Um, such a body is not cumulative. It would be a fool's errand to try and render one's theory consistent with evidence like this. So I think this plot should make you really anxious. Um, and I think this uh, prima facie problem for the minimal commitment of empiricism stems precisely from thinking of the evidence relevant to adjudicating empirical adequacy as results, um, as being made above results. And yet it seems to me that this way of thinking about evidence is implicit in much of the philosophy of science. So philosophers of science often assume something like the following picture. So there are products of um, theorizing that are compared to products of experimentation or observation. And if these products agree, then empirical adequacy is maintained. And in fact, we often just see uh, evidence denoted by the letter E. And the sort of thing, the things that get slotted in for E um, if they are specified at all, are usually neat propositions like this swan is white, the red ball was drawn, Jones is a senior, or um, occasionally the melting point of lead is 327 degrees Celsius. So to put it harshly, um, we treat evidence qua results as though they're the sort of thing that one might glean from an abstract of a scientific publication or a news headline when we stray from toy examples at all. Um, and I want to discuss um, some problems for this family of use of evidence. So like any account on which evidence can be detached from information about the processing by which it was generated and still be useful for adjudicating empirical adequacy. So um, in their 2005 paper, Evading the IRS, <laughs> you guys have seen this, the, uh, Bogan and Woodward, um, where IRS stands for um, inferential relations between sentences. Um, they criticize a collection of such views, which they take to be uh, ubiquitous as well. They write, um, the best known versions of IRS are hypothetical deduct deductive and positive instance, including bootstrapping confirmation theories. It goes without saying um, that such accounts, along with the problems they generate, have exerted a dominant influence on philosophers who study the epistemology of science. <clears throat> so I won't give you a full survey of philosophers. Um, 
who hold such views here, but I can show you a quote that I take to be typical of the way of treating evidence that I want to criticize. <clears throat> and this is John Worrell from a 2011 paper um, reporting Laudan and Lepland's much discussed paper from 91, Empirical Equivalence and, under <laughs> and Underdetermination. Okay. So first, divide the vocabulary of the common language uh, within which any two theories T and T prime are expressed into the purely empirical or observational vocabulary and the theoretical vocabulary. T and T prime are then empirically equivalent, just in case the sets of their deductive consequences that are expressible in the purely observational language are identical. And then Worrell adds, I take it here that the purely logical and mathematical vocabulary is shared. We want to say that, for example, um, there are two planets in that portion of the sky is in the observational language, while there were two electrons in that section of the bubble chamber is in the theor theoretical language. Okay, so the, you know, the idea is that the, um, the empirical content of, of the theories, that is the deductive consequences expressible purely in the observation language, um, is what is supposed to be checked directly against the empirical evidence, that is observation statements uh, expressed also in the observational vocabulary. <coughs> so for instance, um, the hypothesis derived from theory says, there are two planets in that portion of the sky, and we checked uh, that against the observation statement, there are two planets against, uh, in that portion of the sky. But I think that um, detached views of evidence are problematic even if evidence is taken to be something other than sentences in the pure observation language. So um, even if um, uh, we consider uh, propositions that contain theoretical vocabulary, or estimated parameter values, or data models, uh, or even records of data collection. As long as such results are detached from the hypotheses by which they were generated, they will man manifest the same sort of fool's errand in attempts to adjudicating empirical adequacy, because just detached results are prone to discord. If we consider only the bare results of whatever sort, there are cases where it looks like we first get E and then evidence not E. So considering empirical evidence as detached results, one cannot account for the adherence to the minimal commitment of empiricism in such context. We cannot ask of our theories that they be consistent with all of the available evidence if the evidential corpus is itself inconsistent. Okay. So I want to highlight um, what I think is another serious problem for detached views of evidence besides discord. So um, a, a detached view of evidence implies that attempting to constrain theories with evidence originally generated in another epistemic context, scientists will either risk mistakenly adjudicating the adequacy of their theories or fail to be able to use that evidence at all. And this is because empirical results can be maladapted to the theory whose empirical adequacy one would like to adjudicate. So here we can think of any empirical result that's supposed to constrain um, a theory on the other side of a scientific revolution, um, marking stark changes in conceptual frameworks uh, within which such results are expressed. So for instance, um, ancient Chinese records of astronomical events are reported in terms of categories quite different than them. These observation records refer to um, like coaxing, visiting stars, posting, bushy stars, and huixing, sweeping stars, not say comets and supernova, even accounting for translation, right? So how, um, but an empirical result can be maladapted, uh, I think, to a theory in a variety of ways besides being expressed in um, maladaptive conceptual terms, since the final form of an empirical result can depend on many, many intermediary processing stages in which researchers may employ instrumentation, theories, models, modes of analysis, and representation schemes that contribute to the form and content of the result. So for instance, the fact that the data collected may be discrete, the fact that certain algorithms may be used to transform the data, um, the fact that the value of the result may be given to three decimal places all reflect the sense in which the result may be conditioned on pre presuppositions made throughout the process. So if the constraining power of empirical results cannot be freed from these original presuppositions, then much evidence must be lost to the annals of history. That is, if results unshakably calcify the commitments of the epistemic context in which they were generated, then they are doomed to perish with it. This loss of evidence would pose an epistemic risk, I think, insofar as any abandoned evidence haunts subsequent theories as an unchecked possibility. Yet detached views of evidence have no resources to show how evidence produced in one context may be transformed to a new context to which it is initially maladapted. 
since on such views, results are considered apart from the presuppositions, even as they embody them. So I want to suggest that these two issues, um, apparent discord in the evidential corpus and the threat of the loss of evidence across epistemic contexts, are symptoms of detached views of empirical evidence. It is in virtue of isolating empirical results from the details of their provenance that, problems, that the problems of discord and loss get their teeth. Um, so I'll argue that these, these problems dissolve once we adopt, adopt a view of evidence in which the utility of empirical results as constraints on theory, theory is inseparably, inseparably tied to information about the manner in which they were generated. Okay. So, um, so much for the first part of the talk. Uh, in the remainder, I want to introduce um, the alternate view of evidence, uh, which I'll illustrate with a case study from astrophysics. And then I'll explain how um, <coughs> thinking about evidence in this way should be reflected in our conceptions of empirical evidence. So rather than thinking of the evidential corpus as made up of a bunch of um, detached E's, we ought to think of it as made up of lines of evidence enriched by auxiliary information about how those lines were generated. So by line of evidence, I mean a sequence of empirical results, um, including the records of data collection and all subsequent products of data processing, generated on the way to some final empirical constraint. And by auxiliary information, I mean metadata regarding the provenance of data records and the processing workflow that transforms them. And so together, a line of evidence and its associated metadata compose what I'm calling an enriched um, line of evidence. And the evidential corpus as a whole is then to be made up of many such enriched lines of evidence. We can talk about plenty of examples of metadata um, and data products. Okay. So the the mistake of detached views is to break off a part of the line of evidence and attempt to use that to adjudicate empirical accuracy. And I'd like to illustrate concretely what a line of evidence, what an enriched line of evidence looks like um, by considering um, an example which indicates how rich indeed lines of evidence can be and highlights the importance of considering the whole line when attempting to responsibly constrain a theory. So <clears throat> the example I want to consider is well known to astronomers and gravitational theorists. Um, before the recent results from LIGO, um, observations of the Hulse-Taylor pulsar had been the best available evidence for the existence of gravitational radiation as predicted by GR. So you think of a pulsar on an LG with a, um, with a lighthouse, it's a spinning object that emits a beam of electromagnetic radiation, and you're probably aligned with respect to the axis of the beam, and you see a pulse um, go by at regular intervals. Um, so the, the whole tail of star is part of a binary system, it has a companion neutron star, and together these orbit um, their common center of mass, and um, the binary system is thought to lose, uh, lose gravitational energy, and uh, uh, thereby tightening the orbits of, the, of this system over time. Okay. So um, observations of this pulsar are taken as confirmation of GR, because the decay of the pulsar's orbit appears to match the general relativistic prediction precisely. So for instance, um, in one of the first major articles reporting these results, written in 82, Taylor and Weisberg state, quote, we argue that the observed rate of decay of the orbit firmly establishes the existence of gravitational radiation as predicted by general relativity. At the same time, several other theories are shown to be inconsistent with the observations. And from what I've just given you here, this looks just like one, let, just looks just like what one would expect on a detached um, view of evidence, right? Like you have the um, orbital uh, decay rate PV dot from observation and the predicted value of PV dot, and you straightforwardly compare them to see if, you're, um, if they're consistent or not, okay? But um, to get to that final result, you have to start here um, with a signal from the Arecibo Observatory. And from there, at a very coarse level uh, of description, the data processing goes like this. So data from the receiver comes with interference from like, nearby radio towers <laughs> and other astronomical objects that you're not interested in, uh, which need to be removed. In addition, um, the pulses picked up by the, by the telescope are so weak from this object that in order to obtain a high enough signal to noise ratio, um, the effective dispersion due to the interaction of the um, signal with three electrons on its way to Earth um, is compensated for in hardware and the pulses are averaged together in blocks of 5,000 pulses before any data is ever written to disk um, or at tape for the case of some of, some of, these, um, some of these observation runs. 
Um, and then the, um, the data is fit to some particular model of the binary system in order to extract parameter value estimates. And then the values associated with the different data sets have to be appropriately weighted. So these different observation runs have different, um, you know, different conditions associated with them that have to be taken into account. Um, and uh, these different parameter values have to be combined into a single set of adopted parameter values. Those parameter value estimates can then be compared to the values pr predicted from theory. And finally, one can arrive at the claim of gravitational waves exist in the confirmation of GR. But of course, as you can imagine, each of these steps is quite involved. Um, but to just give you a sense of the sort of substantive assumptions that um, go into this process, let's just focus on the transformation of the reduced data into values of parameters um, of the model fit to the data. So the, um, the reduced data consists in pulse arrival times in the reference frame of the telescope. And in order to fit um, the model to these pulse times, it's convenient to express them in the pulsar, res in the pulsar reference frame. So um, after correcting the pulse times for relativistic effects, including the annual variation of the rate of terrestrial clocks, um, this transformation is accomplished by way of an intermediary step in which the times are transformed to the reference frame of the solar system very center. Um, and in order to do that, one needs uh, the precise position of the Earth, which is supplied by you know, a particular version of the Lincoln Laboratory planetary ephemeris. Um, and then the solar system very center times are transformed into the pulsar frame, including more relativistic corrections, uh, you know, gravitational propagation delayed to the presence of the companion star, and that involves using estimates that were, um, that were generated in earlier research. Okay, so then the, the pulse phase can be calculated from a Taylor series expansion involving the pulsar rotational frequency and its derivatives, and the um, pulse times are fit to a particular general relativistic model of the binary system, which have, makes, um, as, you know, assumes that the pulsar is an intrinsically accurate clock, and the two stars um, can be modeled as point masses. Um, uh, you know, it's, so it's fit to this model using the least squares method with residuals calculated from the pulse phase. Okay, so I hope you can see that um, the empirical value of the orbital decay parameter achieved from this research and the existence uh, and confirmation claims that rely on it are the result of the intricate interplay of substantive assumptions, calculations, and inferences that go into generating the line of evidence beginning with signals uh, at the Arecibo receiver. And empirical results are, um, as I said, skillfully wrought from data records by the introduction of often elaborate presuppositions. Um, and you just think like this, I'm giving you this example from, from what, 82? Um, just, <laughs> just think about how complicated you could make this sort of story um, in, you know, pick, pick your favorite scary recent science <laughs> that involves Many more, many more stages in data processing than this. Um, so, given that the results are so process dependent in, in this example, how did Taylor and Weisberg expect to be able to use the result to constrain alternative gravitational theories? Because, after all, I've just said that the relativistic corrections to the pulse arrival times were made relatively early in the data processing. Already in transforming the pulse arrival times um, from the reference frame of the receiver on Earth, one assumes that GR is the correct gravitational theory. So that there's at least a potential danger in using the final estimated uh, value um, of the orbital decay parameter to constrain alternative theories. If the early assumptions turn out to be problematic, then the, then the result has been contaminated very early on. And we'll, I'll have something more to say, um, more specific to say about what kind of assumptions are problematic shortly. But thinking hypothetically for a moment, um, suppose that the alternative gravitational theory um, one would like to constrain implies substantially um, different corrections that should be made to the terrestrial clocks than, um, than GR. Um, this difference would then propagate all the way through the data processing to inflict a difference in the final result calculated for the um, rate of decay parameter. So it would then be misguided for someone to try and constrain the hypothetical alternative theory with the empirical parameter, parameter um, generated, assuming GR. Um, but notice that this is, 
precisely the sort of problem that a detached view of evidence can't address. If the detached result that, a view, that such a view recognizes as evidence um, turns out to be maladapted to the theory you'd like to constrain, then that piece of evidence must either be lost to history or worse, mistakenly use it as if it were well adapted, um, thereby corrupting our knowledge of the empirical status of our theories. So can I just ask, yeah. is, as I understood the correction is something like time dilation, that the things that, you know, is, 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 in my simple mind picture, you just got a moving thing, mm -hmm. and so you're gonna have to correct its clock for the time dilation. Mm -hmm. but, so and that's sort of like a special relativistic claim, and I was imagining that we're now looking at theories of gravity that are dealing with more that might agree that we'll probably agree on the local special you know special relativistic physics. So but is that not the case? Yes, yeah, okay. Yeah. So I think I think you're right in this case mm -hmm. that the um, that these guys are you know not doing anything illicit. Um, they're actually they're actually making perfectly fine assumptions and even in cases of stuff that might look more suspect further up in the chain, they they have an appendix where they provide some reasons for thinking that those are good assumptions. And I think you're, you're right that those, that the particular assumptions made in this case actually don't, they they're, they they're, can perfectly well make those assumptions and constrain the theories that they're interested in constraining. Um, so that's what that's what I want to say just now. Uh, when, you know, so the thought was, you know, suppose it, so, you know, I maybe I need to find like a, you know, it's hard to catch scientists doing this wrong. <laughs> I, 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 I found one, um, this paper of Rax et al, where I totally thought I had them, and then, and then I'm, not, I'm not, I can show you that piece if you want to talk about it. And I, and I, I think they're actually still fine. But, but then again, you talk to, so I, yeah, then again, you talk to researchers um, about where they get their evidence and how much they look into the background information. Um, and they're like, oh yeah, we don't really do that. And then you press a little bit, and they're like, oh yeah, okay, we actually did. So it's kind of, it's, it's a little bit hard to see how prescriptive I think I can be with this. But um, so at the moment, yeah, speaking to philosophers, um, I'm interested in saying, uh, you know, okay, let's, what sort of assumption, where, where could this go wrong? Um, what kind of assumptions could one make that would cause a problem in constraints? I mean, I guess all I'm going to throw is if it's if it were gravitational time dilation, then you might expect that, that, that some competing theory of gravity wouldn't exhibit it. If it were just time dilation due to the relativistic motion, then you'd think that everybody should agree about that, right? Just in competing theories of gravity. So it would just depends on what, what the competitors. Look so like. maybe the um, maybe in the case of the the later the correction later from the companion star that would. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so um, when are uh, you know what sort of presuppositions are pro are problematic? Are the problematic ones that make a result maladapted to the theory that we'd like to construct? So I think first of all, um, you know, results that are you know are given in concepts, parameters, or other vehicles that um, aren't found in the theory to be constrained, you know, obviously one can't like straightforwardly constrain one's theory of supernova with the bushy star observations. Um, but uh, another, another, so an, an initially plausible thought um, is that, you know, when any time a presupposition from a genuine competitor theory is assumed somewhere in the, um, the chain of processing, then the result will be maladapted. Um, but that's not, this is not quite right. So, um, Lehman, uh, 1988, gives a nice example of this just in the context of the michelson morley experiment, um, looking for the effect of the uh, ether, vo ether velocity on the speed of light. So, according to Lehman, um, Michelson modeled his experimental apparatus using simple single ray optics and made assumptions formally inconsistent with the theory he was trying to constrain. Um, however, using Consistent assumptions would have resulted in a fourth order correction in the context of an experiment to measure a second order effect, and so thus didn't make a significant difference to the constraint. So, and in fact, I think something similar happens in the Hulse Taylor Pulsar case. Um, although they assume general to be an early uh, stage of data processing, they point out that the results thus calculated can be used to constrain some other gravitational theories that are formally inconsistent with DR since, quote, none of those theories predicts 
even the proper sign of orbital period change due to the emission of gravitational radiation level of the proper magnitude. So any difference that substituting the alternate um, theories into the data processing stages could make um, to the uh, empirically derived parameter value apparently uh, would not make a significant difference to the constraint on theory. Okay. So in light of this, we'll say that um, in order to constrain some theory, an empirical result must be well adapted to the context of constraint, and that this requires that all of the presuppositions that have been incorporated into the result throughout the course of data collection and processing are either formally compatible with the theory, or else their incorporation does not influence the constraint thereby obtained in a manner that differs significantly um, from the influence that formally compatible assumptions would have imparted had they been incorporated instead. So, and one hopes that scientists themselves are good about checking to make sure that the results they use to constrain their theories are indeed well adapted to their theories. Um, but suppose that the result in question is maladaptive. It may be possible um, to salvage a constraint anyway, as long as enough information is available about how the result was generated, to backtrack through um, stages of data processing in order to find a product of, uh, of an earlier stage that is adaptable um, to the theory to be constrained, and then reprocess uh, using the resources of the new theory, uh, thereby generating a well-adapted result. So in this way, an enriched line of evidence, the stages of data processing um, uh, considered together with information about how the processing was accomplished, provides the resources with which a particular empirical result can be brought to bear on frameworks other than that which uh, was originally used, in a way simply not available to someone with a detached view of evidence. And thinking about enriched evidence allows us to account for how it is that empirical adequacy is supposed to be adju adjudicated with respect to all available the collection of uh, empirical results considered together with auxiliary information about how they were generated is not internally consistent, just as there's no contradiction between uh, FX and P and F and not P, even though there is one between P and not P. And the enriched evidence uh, uh, view has the resources to account for how scientists maintain the minimal commitment of empiricism by doing due diligence to check the empirical adequacy of their theories. In other words, taking, a, taking into account auxiliary information um, it is no longer mysterious how theories could be expected to be empirically adequate with respect to prima facie discordant results and with initially maladaptive results. And so this is how I suggest uh, we need to think about evidence in order to avoid the failure of detached views to account for the minimal commitment. So the evidence, the evidence with respect to which empirical adequacy is adjudicated on this view is all the available data records and um, data products considered together with all the available information about how the data was collected and processed. Many, many rich lines of evidence. And I'm happy to talk about um, what I mean by available here, too, um, if you like. Okay. So this view is um, a lot thicker than the detached view. But I think it needs to be this thick. Um, in some cases, data processing needs to be rolled all the way back to the original records, as in um, the case for you know, the uh, records of historical supernova. Um, and indeed, the very relevance of some result for constraining the theory in the first place depends on all the details of data collection and processing. Okay. So you could start to worry at this point that no one ever has access <laughs> to all of the details of data collection and processing. Whatever we say about of what availability is supposed to be. Okay. Um, and that as a result, this view is like utterly impractical. <laughs> Um, but I want to say that um, although all of the presuppositions that contribute to the generation of a constraint are implicated in the epistemic relevance and adaptedness of that constraint to theoretical context, in practice, the entire enriched line of evidence need not be considered explicitly. So for instance, researchers may have good reasons to believe that the instrument used to collect data was well calibrated without explicitly considering the available information surrounding calibration. However, if a uh, reason to be suspicious of the instrument's calibration um, arises later on, as it sometimes does, <laughs> revisiting the information um, available about calibration could become epistemically imperative. So we can often take things for granted until we can't. And there are such lovely examples of this in, in the history of science, today, including wonderful recent examples. <laughs> um, 
So the problems that um, apparent discord in the evidential corpus and the threat of the loss of evidence across epistemic context cause for making sense of the minimal commitment of empiricism, I think, dissolve once we adopt a view of evidence which, um, in which the epistemic utility of empirical results as constraints on scientific theories is inseparably tied to information about the manner in which they were generated. So results conditioned on their presuppositions um, should not be discordant, and with enough auxiliary information, results can be repurposed to new contexts. So um, to summarize what we've got so far, a lot goes into generating empirical results, and data collection, reduction, and analysis can all introduce substantive assumptions upon which those results are conditioned. And in order to use empirical results to constrain theorizing, scientists need access to a lot of information about the processes by which they, those results are generated. To use old evidence or um, evidence generated using diverse theoretical frameworks, even in contemporary cases, um, scientists need to be able to um, retrace the stages of data processing. And this can only be accomplished if there is enough available documentation about how the original results were produced. When there is, investigators can revisit the analyze and the interpret in order to render the data relevant to the particular theory at hand. Um, in order to play its role in the adjudication of empirical adequacy, evidence needs to be adaptable in this way. But there's a sense in which evidence is nevertheless, like, I hate to use the words stable, so maybe like obstinate <laughs> instead, um, in the sense that there's an onus on any viable theoretical framework to furnish a way of interpreting it in a consistent um, manner. So empirical evidence is cumulative I think, and uh, remains relevant across multiple theoretical contexts. Um, and this accumulated body of evidence provides continuity between researchers such that the same evidence is relevant for scientists working in different theoretical <coughs> Okay, so with this um, in rich view of evidence in hand, what would it mean for a theory to be adequate with respect to the evidence that's construed? Um, so I want to say that um, a theory is empirically adequate when, for every result in the evidential corpus, the line of evidence that produced that result shares a product of data processing with some line of evidence, the result of which is both well adapted to and consistent with that theory. So theories, uh, intuitively, um, theories are empirically adequate when they can make sense of all empirical results on their own terms. Um, and. Uh, a theory fails to be empirically adequate when there's at least one result for which there's no line of evidence sharing a product of data processing with that result that leads to some other potentially um, result that's both well adapted and consistent um, with the theory. So theories that fail to accommodate at least one result fail to be empirically adequate as one might expect. And I'll walk you through um, what I think are the conditions under which can hope, one can hope to adjudicate the empirical adequacy of some theory, um, which I'm going to do by filling in this probably totally unnecessary decision tree new tri structure. Um, so the conventions are that diamonds are questions that are answered no on the left and yes on the right. And if you land in a yellow box, um, then you're in a dead end and the empirical adequacy of your theory cannot be determined with respect to the evidence under consideration. But if you land in a green box, if you make your way to a green box, um, then you can follow, uh, th then you are in a position to determine uh, if the, consistent, the consistency of your theory with respect to that evidence. So um, being able to judge the relevance of a result to a theory is a necessary condition for being able to use that result as a constraint um, on theory in an epistemically responsible way. Um, and the relevance of results depends crucially on the provenance of data from which it drives. So without metadata on data collection, the relevance of an empirical result for a constraining theory cannot be judged. So you need, whatever else, you, you, know, you definitely need um, metadata on data collection. And you can see this because, um, you know, like imagine you're, you know, when I worked in the nuclear physics lab, you'd go into a room that hadn't been used in a while and open a drawer and there'd be like all kinds of like charts and piles of stuff, printouts of old experiments in there. And if you don't have, if that's all you have, you, it's totally, this is totally useless to you. You have no idea what you're looking at, right? So, uh, you know, at the very least, you need to know um, what the source of these, um, these data were. Okay. Um, and then obviously one needs um, some record 
like either the original record of data collection or some subsequent re record of process data um, uh, to be able to derive uh, an empirical constraint. And if the constraint um, is to be derived from subsequent records of process data, then metadata on that processing is also necessary um, for generating a constraint for the same reason um, that metadata on collection is necessary. Um, so if um, the original data records are not available, and the subsequent records of data processing are maladapted to the theory we constrained, um, then the reversibility of data processing is, is a necessary condition for being able to generate a result. Um, so you could have a uh, maladapted result, but still be okay because you can reverse the processing and uh, generate a, 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 a well-adapted result using your own resources. So, so for instance, um, the as I mentioned, uh, uh, Chinese records such as this one of the guest star in um, 1054 have been important sources of evidence for constraining models of supernova. So if the um, supernova remnant can be identified and the original observation of the event dated precisely, then models um, uh, can be tested against the, you know, models of the um, of mechanisms of supernova and the, the evolution of the remnants um, can be tested against the, this data. So this is, you know, and you need, the, you need the historical records to date the thing precisely, if the key component of testing these models. So this is, to be able to use those historical records is really quite a feat, um, because translating them in a useful way requires extensive background knowledge about the conditions under which uh, the events would have been viewed, what observations were used for, um, and subtle historically specific linguistic nuances regarding time and spatial measurement. So, um, the earliest supernova for which there's a known record, uh, SN185, has been associated with this remnant. Um, and for some time, it was unclear whether the records of observations referred to a supernova or a comet. Um, and part of distinguishing between the two possibilities came down to translating the word yawn, which referred to the apparent size of the object, um, but could have meant uh, half a bamboo mat. <laughs> indicating a meter and therefore a comet, um, a low stool, which is only 30 to 50 centimeters, or it could have uh, simply been like an imaginative configuration. And the historians argue about this. Um, but they decided in the end it was super. <laughs> um, so, so you need to know a lot in order to, in, in order to, you need a lot of background information in order to use these things. But once you have them, incredibly useful for constraining contemporary models of supernova, like the, um, the, the, the mechanisms of um, quark labs, for instance. Okay. So a consequence of um, adopting the enriched view of evidence is that one becomes seriously concerned <laughs> with careful documentation and data stewardship and very worried about the lack of access that scientists have, uh, in fact, to data and to metadata. And so here's um, something to keep you up at night. Um, the, this is Goodman et al. Um, 2014, who are information scientists. Um, the amount of real data and data description in modern publications is almost never sufficient to, e to repeat or even statistically verify a subject being uh, presented, a study being presented. Worse, researchers wishing to build upon and extend work presented in the literature often have trouble recovering data associated with an article after it's been published. More often than scientists would like to admit, they cannot even recover the data associated with their own <laughs> published works. And if that wasn't scary enough, there's this. Um, NASA is generally regarded as the paragon of technical achievement. <laughs> it successfully sent a man to the moon at the dawn of the digital age. <laughs> it developed robots to explore the heavens and invent all, invented all manner of gadgets. So of course NASA <laughs> has preserved the record of all of its great achievements. Wrong. It turns out that the agency did not preserve data from its very first mission, Explorer 1. It does not have many of the original tapes from the human exploration of the moon. It has lost much data on the Earth. Um, or it has lost much of the early Landsat data, which otherwise forms such a valuable longitudinal record of our planet's environmental changes. The list goes on. If one of the most technologically advanced organizations on Earth has forever lost a great deal of highly valuable irreplaceable data from just a few decades ago, what has been going on elsewhere. <laughs> um, 
Um, so in this talk, uh, I hope to persuade you that detached views of evidence um, cannot make sense of how scientists uphold the minimal commitment of empiricism due to uh, apparent loss um, and discord. Um, and uh, an enriched view of evidence um, recovers the commitment by eliminating the resources by which these problems can be addressed. Um, but once we adopt an enriched view of evidence, it becomes clear that the extended background information required to determine if the theory is empirically adequate has been severely and 